Hey guys, welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop is called Gearworks by Peacekeeper Games. Gearworks is for two to four players, takes about a half an hour to 45 minutes to play, and is for ages 13 and up. In the game Gearworks, you're a tinkerer and you're trying to make contraptions, right? And by doing so, you're going to be moving cogs throughout the game and placing down these specific parts to try and score these parts at the end of the game. When you score them, you're able to put them on contraptions, and, or uh, during each round, uh, score them and get, put them on different contraptions gain points after three rounds is over you're going to score all the contraptions you made all the spare parts you have and all the sparks you didn't use which are special actions that you can choose to use on your turn the person with the most points is the winner this game is interesting because it's like a puzzle style game and it's a little confusing to explain just in person luckily i can go ahead and show you down below exactly how it is played so here we have gear works and everything included there's the box for the game and of course the rules really wonderfully done and the art oof man anyway that's not the review time uh and of course the setup for the game. I've went ahead and set it up for three players as you can see here, but let's go through all the components. This is the board area. You've got the uh, gear cards, you've got the gear works turning little guys here, and the parts here. These are contraptions, these are gear cards. This is for the single player game, so you can actually play it this solo, and of course the extra player not using. Over here are sparks, which you'll utilize for special actions throughout the game. You're going to have your placement cards as well as your uh, return order action cards, and of course your players that you get to choose, and each player actually has a special ability on it. When you use them, you can turn them over. You're also going to start the game off with five of these gear cards, one contraption, and one of these sparks. And the grid is pretty easy to set up as well. In a two-player game, you're actually going to minimize the board by reducing this by one. But in a three or four-player game, you're going to have A, B, C, D, and E, one, two, three, and four. And then you're going to set it up on B1 and A1, just a random one of these parts cards, and then uh, D4 and uh, E3. Three, not gear cards, by the way. After you've done that, this is the first setup, and you're going to do this setup every time for each round, and there's three rounds. To begin the game, you have a choice of playing a card down onto the area here, or you can choose to pass. If you pass, you're done, unless you choose to spend a spark on your next turn to come back into the round. If it consecutively passes throughout the game, that is what's going to end the round and begin a new round. However, there's also optional actions you can take after choosing a card. Uh, first of all, though, there's also placement rules. The first rule is whenever you're going down a column, you can't have uh, any more than one color. So if there's silver here, silver can't be in any of these three spaces. Yellow here, no yellow in these spaces. Green here, no green in these spaces. Also, when you're playing a card, so for instance, this one here, uh, you're going to be, when you can choose to play it in any area you want, provided it's legally allowed. And uh, the, uh, the rule for the rows over here is when you place a card down, let's say you want to play one over here, you're actually going to make sure that it goes in ascending or descending order. So a one here means that the four is next, which is ascending. So one, four, you can play a four here, a five, a six, or a seven. But you have to always make it ascending. And if you can't do that, you can't play the card. Also, when you play your card down, you're going to take one of these uh, gears here and rotate it to your player color. So for instance, right now it's, it's there on blanks, but this player here is Jade and she would actually move it to silver and move this to silver as well. A and one are now controlled by silver. Then of course, after she's played her card, she can choose to use any of her spark actions. And spark actions are pretty cool. You can choose to uh, spend sparks to place your cards on top of other gears as opposed to your actual basic placement action. You can go ahead and choose to uh, draw extra ones of these cards here, and you can choose to draw extra ones of cards of these here. Uh, these ones here are contraptions and what you're trying to score throughout the end of the round. If you, at the end of the round, control C and 3 for this player here, or this player here control D and 4, they can use the parts that they controlled, uh, to, that they've gained, to uh, make contraptions. Another interesting aspect of the game when placing down cards is when you place down a card, you can take the cards that are up, down, left, and right, the closest ones, and if you can make uh, them plus or minus each other to equal your card, then you can actually score a spark, and that's how you're going to be scoring sparks throughout the round. This is a one, though, so a four and a two is a six, a four and minus a two is a two, so that would not score this player a spark. Had this player played a red two, for, for instance, though, that would score him, a, him or her a spark. After that is done, he doesn't want to play any additional action. He, could, he or she could choose to then pass, and the next player is going to get to go. So I'll show you an actual round of play as to what somebody would probably likely want to do. He wants a D and a 4. So there's a D here, and there's a 4. Uh, and unfortunately, there's already a card here. So he could at least go for maybe a D, right? And what he could do is play this blue 6. When he plays this blue 6, it's, it, 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 it's going to go like that, basically. And it'll be going... Oh, no, it would go like this, I think, yes. Uh, and that would make it go in descent, uh, uh, ascending this way, I guess. So it would be 5, 6... Uh, oh no, this is a nine. 
five, and nine, and so only nines can be played here. That's a really nasty card to play right there because that can definitely affect things uh, negatively. I think it's a nine at least. Let me see here. Uh, yeah, I think it's a nine. Uh, but you could also, maybe he could also have chosen to play a different card to make a little bit, let me make it a little more easier for me to explain. So seven here. Uh, then he's going to go ahead and check left and right. Five plus four is nine. Five minus four is one. He wouldn't score a spark. Uh, he would actually turn these over to his color, which would make it red over here and make it red over here. And now ascending order for this way. You have to play a seven or an eight or a nine in order to place over in these areas here. Um, and he's going to be getting at least his D. Uh, hopefully at the end of the game. However, these are going to move around as players play in these different areas. Uh, like I said, he could choose to spend his sparks uh, to uh, gain different cards and whatnot, uh, to utilize putting cards on top of others. So he could actually have spent two sparks if he had it to place this on top of that, which would then have scored the ones he needed. Um, he could also gain new contraptions, which are basically kind of like Ticket to Ride, in which you're trying to secure specific things on the board in order to gain the benefits in points at the end of the round. The next player get to go, and so on and so forth, until everyone chose to pass, which is most likely when the board is going to be filled up. This card here is interesting. All the characters have their own abilities. This one says you can slide a gear card in a row. So if he wanted to, he could turn this card over and slide a gear card in a row, and that would be his special ability. Everybody else has one as well, and if you don't use it at the end of the round, you get an extra spark for free. At the end of the round, you're going to calculate all of the different areas you control. You're going to take the parts from those areas, and then you're going to score. You're going to score any contraptions you choose to score and putting by putting parts on them. You could choose to put just one part on them, or or you could choose to put two, provided you had those parts, and that would score either four or nine points, depending on how many you had. Also, if let's say that he didn't end up scoring those two, and he scored a uh, two and he scored an E, he could just score these parts individually for two points apiece, and that's going to give him bonus points, uh, that's going to give him basic, ba basic points at the end of the round, and he can choose to keep this. You're going to get to choose to keep all of your cards, all of your sparks, and all of your contraptions that you don't want to use at the end of the round, but parts are always going to be spent. They don't carry over from round to round. And also the board is going to get cleared and you're going to put cards back into these basic spaces again and continue to the next round. Uh, every card of these that isn't used is going, to, uh, is going to stay and you're going to get a spark for it. And every card that is, you're going to get to flip over and you can reuse it for the next round. The person at the end of the game who has the most points via the contraptions, either fully, fully finished, only half finished, as well as basic parts. And then one point for each spark is going to win the game. The Leviathan aspect of the game is a single player game in which it has specific rules as to how you're going to be able to play it and the level of difficulty involved with it. But that's the basic idea for the game Gearworks. Hopefully I gave you enough of a taste of the game as to how it's played. A puzzly game with a little bit of a a little bit of a take that feel to it and a lot of uh, devious placement in this game. A caveat too is you can choose during the gaining sparks phase where you're trying to look to see if you gain the sparks based on the plus or minus of the adjacent cards. You can discard two gear cards from your hand to take a spark as well. Realize though that gear cards only come back to you during the beginning of the round. You're going to get five new cards. You have a total of eight and if you spend them they're gone forever. They don't come back until the next round and you can also gain them from spending sparks. So two for one is basically how that would work. All the special spending spark abilities are in the rule book and it's pretty simple. There's drawing the gear card replacing the gear card by putting one on top. There's drawing a contraption card which is those special objectives and then there's re-entering the round. If you choose to pass you can spend a, uh, a, a, a spark to come back in during the same round. Otherwise that's it until everybody passes and that would be the end of that specific round. Pretty simple as to how the game goes. The game is a puzzle game and all the gals in my group are amazing at this game and I am terrified. Terrible. That doesn't change my enjoyment for the game, however. It is really well done and very, very unique. It's one of those games where you really need to decide where you want to place things and how you want to place them because it matters so much. It changes throughout the game. The early game is way different than the later game, and the different characters are going to be relevant based on their abilities during either the early or late game as well. You need to set yourself up for a win because the places that you think you're going to have during the game will change and are unlikely for you to actually get to keep them at the end of the game. So you have to be ready to place those things down or use your abilities to gain those spots to get those contraptions to add to the parts to gain the points. If you can do that, you're going to be 
be a master at this game. And it feels like a little bit of like a Sudoku kind of style puzzle, but with players trying to mess you up and changing the grid as they see fit because their objectives are not the same as yours. The uh, single player version of the game is challenging and interesting. And I definitely think you should check this one out. I won't explain it too much, but it feels very similar to the main game. And I think if you understand this aspect, you'll understand the solo variant with a couple of rule changes in the booklet here. Overall, Gearworks is beautifully done. Wonderful. My friend Ferdinand made the Kickstarter uh Kickstarter video of the game, which was really, really good. So well done, good sir. And the game shines through. I wasn't sure if I was going to like this game originally, but as I continued to play it, even after the first game, I was like sold on this game. Even though all the gals stop me in this game every single time, uh, I, usually I play if I want, I want a little bit more of a likelihood of winning, I'll, I'll throw in my cameraman and whatnot. We'll, we'll go for it. But, but for some reason, they're just so on this game. Uh, I don't know, whatever it is. It, it's a lot of fun either way, though. I've lost every time and I've still enjoyed myself. So that is nice with a, a game that's kind of cutthroat like this one. You wouldn't suspect it being cutthroat, but it is. It definitely is. And things that you didn't think your opponent would do end up doing because they actually need certain things that you're not going to expect. And there is enough choices with enough simplicity to the game that it all works out very well. Overall, Gearworks is excellent. Do definitely check out this game. I strongly suggest it. I really enjoyed it, and I'm excited to see the next thing that they come up with, Peacekeeper Games. Well done! <laughs>